I'm glad to finally be here with all of you. Um, I want to start by saying um, very briefly a couple of things about von Hildebrand with my philosophical education. Um, that is not, the, the, my intention is not to edify you, but since I'm going to be critical on several uh, points later, I did not want you to get the misimpression that I didn't like anything in Hildebrand. I like almost everything in Hildebrand and probably would not have been here today were it not for Hildebrand. What do I mean by that? Well, um, as I mentioned at the opening banquet, my undergraduate education at Rhode Island was basically Aristotelian and Thomas. Um, and I didn't really like it. And I had these other ideas and was sort of all alone. Nobody could understand what I was getting at and so on. And then when I finished, I had not planned to go on to graduate school at all. But a very good friend of mine in the department, who was Chairman Dave Freeman, said, why don't you go and talk to this new guy, Fritz Vanish, um, who had just come from Salzburg. And so I went to him and told him uh, it, I was recommended to come and talk to him, and I had these issues. And every single issue that I gave him, he came back with just the response I had been looking for for four and a half years. I'm going to mention three of them because I think these are very central elements in Hildebrand's thought. First, um, now I, I want to mention too that I gave a paper um, three years ago at a phenomenology conference we organized here in which I explained some of these points and Professor Vanish was there and I mentioned this conversation and I was just devastated. He had no recollection of that conversation <laughs> at all. But it was an absolute turning point in my whole life. Uh, okay. Now, the, um, of course, as many of you might know, what's central to Hildebrand is the notion of insight. Um, and in my undergraduate education, what's the method? What's the method? H how are we getting at this? And nobody seemed to have an answer. And then I was explaining Hildebrand's notion of insight into necessary essences. Okay. Um, a second point was the ethics of um, goods was highly teleological. And my thought was always there must be something more to goodness that's intrinsic to the thing then it's goodness simply standing as an end to the fulfillment of some nature or, or appetite. And of course, that came out to be Hildebrand's notion of value, see, intrinsic importance. And then the third was the whole sphere of affectivity, which, um, as many of you probably know by now, um, is of course central to Hildebrand's thought and moves in a very different direction by introducing a third spiritual center of the person besides the intellect and the will, namely the heart. Um, and it only made sense to me, um, especially for theological reasons, that uh, in heaven there must be something felt it, if, if there's the beatific vision, a perfect supernatural happiness couldn't merely be the intellectual contemplation of this. There has to be something felt, see? Um, so, uh, um, and those are such key areas that so much is built upon that, um, of which I would have very few criticisms, um, basically, on that. Uh, that so Hildebrand meant a great uh, his philosophy meant a great deal and of course it opened up into Husserl and Scheler and Stein and, and all of those. Okay, so don't um, have the wrong impression about my critical comments later. Okay. Now I go to a second part, in which I want to tell a few stories. Why do I want to tell stories? Because. Philosophy, especially phenomenological philosophy, starts with experience and must, in everything that it considers, I don't care how abstract it is, metaphysics, 
epistemology, it must somehow come back to be connected with life in some meaningful way. Now, I got the idea for this in reading Lonergan's um, review of the marriage book. Because the first part, I'm waiting for him to get to the marriage book, and he's just talking about how terrible things are with sexuality, marriage, chastity, and so on. Um, in 1942 or 43, um, 80 years ago or 70 years ago. And I started thinking, well, if he had only some idea how things would be now, imagine telling him there's going to be same-sex marriages. I he'd think I was making that up, right? So um, let me tell you a few stories just to give it a contrast of how bad things are now to some other things. Um, my grandmother lived next door to us. She was French-Canadian. And by next door, I mean in the same house, and you just go through a door, and you're in her side of the house. And of course, I was there every day. We got along very well. Um, she told me this story that when she and my grandfather got engaged, that would have been about 1920. He gave her a pearl because when you could not afford a diamond, the man would give the woman a pearl. And at the, up to that time, I don't know how long they were not, probably quite a while, a year maybe, he had never kissed her. Let's think about that. Whole year, never kissed her. Gives her the pearl, and then he said, can I kiss you? And she said, is it necessary? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no. So at the altar, when the priest said, you may kiss the bride, that's to be taken quite literally as the first time. Seventy years ago. We go to another story. Twenty years ago, I was going to teach a course in ethics at my old high school and had to go and meet the principal. It's the first time I had been back to that high school in 20 years, maybe 25 years. And a lot of it I still recognize and so on. But I was just completely shocked because in an area that I would have walked by every day was now daycare. And 15, 16, 17, 18 year old girls were coming in and out with their kids. They were people there to watch them so they could finish their education. And they talked freely about this. And even a teacher that I had had came down, was talking to the girl. It was just a very jovial, carefree, yep, this is the way things are now. But I was quite shocked. I mean, that this is, it can't be an aberration. This must be quite common. And then I would tell you a third <coughs> story. Professor Lee here and I were hired about the same time. <coughs> and when he was in Houston, he would frequently perform, uh, he fre uh, frequently um, was hired to take pictures at weddings, wedding photos, of which he claimed in a good year he could make as much as teaching philosophy. Right? And then when we're talking, he told me this, that all of the photographers down there, so this would again, again about 20, 25 years ago, all the photographers down there were now requesting 50% deposit up front. And the reason is that in 10 to 15% of the cases, by the time the photos were developed, six to eight weeks after the wedding, the couple had already split up. Nobody wants to pay for it because who wants to have the photos of a marriage that has now split up. Yeah, I wonder what Lonigan would think about all of this. 
Now, I make a closing comment. What my concern is with these, these um, instances is that then you have all the instances of people living together and so on, is that when I was young, these things went on. I mean, girls had babies out of wedlock. Couples lived together. But we all understood it was wrong. And that's lost. Now it's just taken as, oh yeah, you better live together six months because if it doesn't work out, you saved yourself a lot of trouble later. See, It's taken as the norm rather than as something wrong, even though it has existed, obviously, for a long time. Okay. That was the end of part two. And I'm going to let you talk in a few minutes, if you would like. Now, this is... Um, Part three, it brings us to Hildebrand's work on marriage, which contains an exposition of spousal love, though not to the degree it's covered in his work on the nature of love. It's a rich book, it, but it's not a difficult book. So I don't want to spend a lot of time summarizing it. I'm going to presuppose a certain familiarity that you have with it, and I will say now I'm simply not competent to address all of the theological issues that are raised in the second half. But I am interested in this, your impressions, your thoughts, your questions, your comments, whether they be positive or negative, about the marriage book. Would anybody like to say something about that? No. You want to hear what I have to say. Yes. Um, I, I really enjoyed the book quite a bit, especially the what you It's very much a romantic but Yes, well Olson Olson says that, doesn't he? But the the one I guess the one book where I kind of stopped was where Glenn Hogan is saying something about love at first sight. Love at first sight. So you think he'd have to hold his love at first sight yeah, I, because I you have this vision of the other. How would be I, I think there's love at first sight. But he said come to full maturity. Full maturity, yeah. I think that part seems a bit of a stretch. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell another story about that in a, a few minutes once I get to the, the next part. Um, and... It, it may be that we have to qualify what we mean by love at first sight, but maybe we'll wait until I get to that story and then you can jump back in. Yeah. Someone else? Yes? Just a quick comment, which I mentioned you earlier, which I noticed. I find it interesting that in purity and in this text on marriage, which are earlier writings of Adam Hildebrand, he doesn't take a solid approach to the affectivity and regarding the will, he seems to have a more traditional approach. And I, I refer to page 32, because when we were talking about the heart, love was mainly affectivity. Right. Here, he says on the bottom of that page, that love is not um, only a previous condition, but a sentiment that both partners must make also an object of the will. So yeah. here he does split love into yeah. as an object of the will. Yeah. Which I just found interesting, because you don't see that in his yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mentioned to you, um, though one would have to look at maybe some of the other writings of that period or before, that um, thinkers mature. You know, they yes. develop notions that um, over time that maybe were only latent or potential before. Yeah. Someone else, yeah. I'm, I'm not hearing anything too negative here. I, I, I know that he treats it, but... He does seem to have a very limited understanding of procreation. Procreation, yes. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about that. Yeah. He doesn't seem to give it a lot of... Yes, um, I'm going to talk a lot about that. Yes? I, th I think that was perhaps a better later in his writings than in his response to it. I think that 
we could actually see that procreation is not only a purpose but also a meaning. Yes. Yes. He mentioned there's a passage there in which um, he says the meaning of marriage is not just procreation. In the marriage book, the meaning is not just procreation. So now he seems to have contrasted that issue of procreation as a primary end, and now you have a meaning. And he seems to have brought into the meaning procreation as well as marriage as a, a community and love. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just speak up a little bit for the people who are watching. That's going to be my last set of comments. Okay. See if, if you find what I say acceptable. Yeah. All right, so maybe I will go to part four, because part five is where I have my major points and criticisms. Part four I call tidbits. These are little points that I want to raise um, about von Hildebrand. Um, I have four of them, though the fourth one is not really <clears throat> a criticism. I wanted to say something about his phrase uh, or his treatment, uh, which Professor Crosby brought up and seemed to agree with Hildebrand on, that love is blind. Um, now, I'm sure that saying has been around a long time. You think he is agreeing with that? Yes. You didn't mean to agree with Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I thought he, he says it's the very opposite. The very opposite, yes. But I'm saying I don't think it's the very opposite. In other words, I'm saying there is something really legitimate about the claim love is blind. That's what I want to say. Um, you may be right, but I hadn't meant this. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, now, I, I don't want to deny that, the, that, the, uh, that a lover can know the beloved in a deeper way. But I think it's also true that the degree of affection can be so great that it blinds someone to faults or limitations in the other that's only seen by a third party. Um, I actually had a um, uh, thought that came to mind when I was writing this in um, I will sometimes watch the court show Judge Judy. <laughs> and. Um, she made, a, <laughs> she made a comment one time to a young woman who was suing the boyfriend, of course, who she had lived with eight months, and it, now they want to split things up and so on when there's no legal marriage and so on. And, um, but in this case, she was um, quite angry and admonished the young lady because she said, now what did you think he was like? when he asked you to borrow $5,000 so he could buy you a nice engagement ring. <laughs> and she gave it to him. See? Love is blind. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> then, of course, who owns the ring? What's... Now, I think this is borne out by the fact, and I'm going to say something about this later. I was curious to see if any of you would bring it up. One thing Hildebrand never talks about too much, there is a passage here and there, is what happens when you fall out of love. So you've had this vision of the other. Well, sometimes you fall out of love. Why? Well. Do you still have the vision of the other? Or is your vision of the other now modified to the point where there are things in the other that you didn't see, that you now see? And that sort of takes the edge off the affection, and now you move to someone else. See? So I, I think there is something to this. In fact, Hildebrand, I, many of the works on affectivity, I think, stresses that, yeah, you can be overcome by the passion and then not see 
certain things that are there. So I think that there's an element of truth, even though I don't want to deny, yes, you know, that the lover can know the beloved in a deeper way. All right. The other um, point, which I didn't see Hildebrand talking about, and maybe it's understandable he didn't talk about this because it's such a complicated and practical and maybe even non-philosophical um, issue, and that is that he gives the impression when there's love, it naturally leads to marriage. And the point is, though two people are in love, there can be very serious reasons why they shouldn't get married. Now, why pe don't ask me why people should get married. All I'm saying is, is that I can very well uh, understand that though two people are in love, there are simply elements about the relationship, certain qualities about the other that make them realize getting married would present certain difficulties. And um, in this respect, there can be legitimate self-interest. A person could say, were I to marry this person, I can see. She's already been married twice. Yes, she seems to be different, but she has three kids, and one of them was with someone she wasn't married to. And he starts seeing the difficulties that would arise and then says, no, maybe I should not marry her, even though I love her, see? Uh, so their marriage involves additional considerations than just love. And I worry that someone who would read the marriage book, love is glorified, marriage is glorified, oh, we're genuinely in love, oh, yes, I can change him, our love will see us through all the turmoil, and, of course, Oftentimes, that's not at all what happens. Um, but as I say, I can't give you the, the marriage guide, should you marry him or her or not. I only say there are additional considerations that have to be taken into account than love. Okay? And that's, I think, an important point, um, given Hildebrand's treatment where one thinks, oh yeah, well, since we love each other, we should get married and love will conquer all. Okay. Now, a third point um, is the issue of the arranged marriages. Um, now, when you think about it, an arranged marriage is really a terrible thing. I mean, imagine yourself sitting there, parents come to you, saying, oh, we've arranged a marriage with this man or this woman. It's going to take place here. You can meet him or her next week. And um, imagine the um, insult to your freedom that would be taking place at that point. On the other hand, and this gets into the love at first sight, although maybe that has to be analyzed more, um, there are instances in which there's sort of a kind of arrangement that can be made or something in which there's a kind of love at first sight or a commitment at first sight. And so I will tell another story. And as you can see, almost all of my stories are true stories. I had a very good friend, Francis Cook, who taught music at the New England Conservatory of Music for 45 years. Um, Francis Cook was enormously wealthy because the Cook name is well known in Hawaii for um, six or seven generations. Some of you may know the corporation Castle and Cook, and if you don't know it by that name, you certainly know the name Del Monte. And his family owned um, huge plots of land in Hawaii, harvesting fruit, and each summer he would rent a old Victorian house in Cape Ann, which is the north shore of Boston. No one in New England really goes to Cape Cod. That's for the people who don't live in New England. The people who live in New England go to Cape Ann, which is much nicer, though we don't tell those other people that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he would rent this old Victorian house, 15 bedrooms. He'd hire a cook. Tell, just tell the cook what you want to eat 
and we would have a glorious week or two weeks. Now, the, um, some of you may know the movie Hawaii. And um, in the 19th century, what was frequent is that Yale Divinity students, once they became ministers, would then volunteer for missionary work. Hawaii was a place they often went to. And um, there were very strict records kept. This boat had these people, these people, these people. Francis Cook's, I don't know, great, 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 great grandfather or great, great grandfather was on the third or fourth ship that went to Hawaii. And the Yale Divinity School um, gave the young ministers two requirements. One is they were not allowed to own land, and that, of course, was um, flagrantly violated. Um, the other is that they had to, um, when they went to Hawaii, they had to be married because they didn't want them intermarrying. They, I, I don't think it was prejudicial. It's just they thought there would be social difficulties there. Now, of course, that was a strange requirement because since women so frequently died in childbirth, it wasn't long 20 or 30 years there were intermarriages um, um, uh, on most of the islands because there were no, no other white women there. See, a single white woman is not going to go. But Francis Cook's great-great-grandfather wanted to go to evangelize them and he was not married. And he didn't know anyone. And the story I'm going to tell you was not infrequent. In fact, if you look at the historical accounts of this, uh, many of the couples who were going over there had not known each other more than a week. They still called each other Mr. and Mrs. rather than first names. But in any case, Francis Cook told me the story that he needed to get a wife in a couple of days. The ship was leaving. He didn't have any prospects. So he went to the post office and he asked the postmaster, are there any chaste women in this town? <laughs> and the postmaster thought about it. He says, yeah, yeah, there is a woman. And he gave her the directions. So he walked to the house. He knocked on the door. He introduced himself. And he asked to see this woman. She came to the door told her who he was, that he was a minister, that he was going to Hawaii, but he had to be married. And then he said, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, okay. <laughs> she probably didn't say, okay. She said, yes, I will. And a few hours later, they were married, and the next day they were on the ship. And they had seven or eight kids, and everything was fine. That's probably not an arranged marriage. <laughs> but those were very common at that time with respect to these ministers. They, um, and was there love at first sight? I don't know. But she looks at him and she sees a certain purity and kindness and commitment and um, desire to help these people evangelize and so on. And she says, yeah, he's a very nice man. That's it. Okay, and now I make a fourth point. Boy, we're moving right along, um, which is not a criticism. And that is Hildebrand on page 25 of the preface to the marriage mentions the anti-personalism, which is a large topic, multifaceted, numerous dimensions. If anything, from the time it's of that publication to now, the situation is radically, drastically, terribly worse. We've lo it's worse. We've lost completely the sense of the difference between human persons and animals. Computers can think. The features that separated us from the animals are now one by one said to be something that one can find in quantitatively lesser ways, but still there in animals. For example, 
in the Greeks, one of the distinguishing marks of human beings was that they were the only ones capable of a language. But now it's come. Bees have languages, whales, they all communicate, see? Um, or, for example, that the dogs grieve the loss of their master. Or people will say, I know my cat loves me. <laughs> See? Now, <laughs> this makes it very difficult, even at this school, to teach a course on the philosophy of the human person. Because the students come with that already. And I have to say to them, look, I know at least for theological reasons you do not hold that cats and dogs and whales and bees are persons. So we've got to find out something that distinguishes the person from those animals. But the difficulty is every time I put up a feature you're going to tell me that your pet or studies have shown that animals can also do this. So you've got to come up with something here. And they have enormous difficulty with that. And then I have to go back and try to <coughs> rebuild their thinking on this and say, look, read this by Hildebrand. Now, do you really think an animal can love you? And even in the strict sense, though this gets a little bit more contentious, I would say in the strict sense, no animal knows anything. Not by a strict understanding of what we mean by no. So, I thought it was interesting, the anti-personalism, although it's not a theme that's really brought through again and again in the book, unless it's hidden there and I, I didn't see it, but the anti-personalism is, is much, much worse than it's ever been, though it's disguised in this business about the, you know, what the animals can do, language. And so I will say, well, what do you mean by think? Lonigan, in a way, mentions this because he mentions the biological materialism. And in a way, this is the only way these points can be brought in, is that if you claim, well, animals are physical beings and we're physical beings and so when you communicate it's just neurological um, synapses in the brain and speech and um, stimulus and response and so we just have that to a much higher degree see? and then love oh well that's this and this and affections oh this this and this and it's explained in materialistic terms and then I mean when you think about it how could a machine think Someone were to de tell Descartes that, you know, where thinking is prominent. Oh, yeah, a machine can do that. He said, you're, you're, you're insane. A machine couldn't possibly do that. But you see, if you change what you mean by think, this is one thing that I learned by, from Hildebrand, though in other works, I think in the New Tower of Babel, this is brought up. What you do is you change the definition, and then you can get all these things that you want. See, if you make communication stimulus and response, well, yeah, yeah, it's clear animals have stimulus and response. See, so. And that's sort of the end of my part for tidbits. And now I'm into what I call the larger portions. You all get the culinary sense. <laughs> but maybe since um, we're doing well on time, I'll stop there. Um, I have five points on the larger portions, and some of them, especially the fourth, take a little time. But maybe we could spend five or ten minutes if somebody wanted to comment on any of the thing that I said. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I, I thought some of the points were, were well taken, like the fact that there are other considerations. Yeah, yeah, I think that's um, a crucial point. Uh, I mean, you understand the divorce rate's 53%. And there's got to be some love in these things. Even so if it's not infatuation, it's a real thing. Yeah, it's, it's a, still serious. Yeah, yeah. To be asked about the viability yeah, of yeah, possible marriage. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, you know, I just 
Mm-hmm. Blind. blind, yes. I'm, think, I'm just thinking of how, how Hildebrand would deal with that. Yeah. I think he would say two things. Yeah. He would say, is the blindness a kind of human frailty that yeah. commonly accompanies love, or is it of the very nature of love? If you would want to say it's an extrinsic accompaniment given the right. brokenness of human beings in this world, it's not. Uh, yeah. Of, of its essence. And yeah. the second uh, thing he would say is that there's something in love that looks like blindness, but really is, is quite different. And that's what in the love book he calls extending the credit of love uh-huh. to a beloved person. Yeah. Where you somehow see the real self uh, of, of another and take all the faults which you acknowledge as somehow ultimately foreign to the yeah. betrayals of. Yeah. So, you can have a real realism about right. the fault of another yeah. and still yeah. say that that's not who he or she really is. Yeah. And that may look like blindness, but it's really yeah. something like that. Yeah. I think on the first point, you, you, you have to hold that position. You couldn't say it was intrinsic right. to the very nature, but commonly can accompany it. And he talks a lot in the, the book on the heart about how he grants passions can overcome a person to such and so. I don't... Yeah, I don't think that there's a, a problem with that. Um, now, extending the credit, that's what makes me a little bit more nervous because um, if you're extending the credit and you're going to get married and then you start thinking, oh, yeah, I realize that there's this, but he's, I think he'll change and you know, when we're together, things will be different and then if we really love each other, we can work things all out and then they're going to end up in divorce court. It's... Um, I think it really has to be thought through there. I would be more nervous about extending. I can bring out his true self. I don't know about that one. You can not perceive a, a bit of defect in the other. Yeah, well, he, he, the Professor Crosby said, well, you recognize the defects and the faults and so on, but you extend it's not really them. And it may be very well not really them. But this doesn't mean that. Necessarily yeah, that's right. Basis right. For marriage. Right. You may yeah. Extend the credit of yeah. Quality, yeah. Good judgment. Right. Right. Is not in yeah. Mood. Yeah. I mean, you could extend the credit even in friendship, and say, "Oh, yeah, he got into trouble, and he, um, the, he had debts, and this is why he committed the crime, and so on." But that's not really him, um, and still have a love of friendship there with him. I, I think that's certainly the case. Yeah. Yeah. We see. Now, I'm not sure I kept track. I think you were second, third, and then fourth. Yes? I feel like the extending the credit is actually something that Catholic, like, initially when we have that feeling in love, I feel like it is a blindness because often the things that are the faults, we don't recognize them as faults. We recognize them as these cute little quirks about them <laughs> <laughs> that later become these huge annoyances. They, we didn't initially say, oh, yes, that's their fault, um, but I'm overlooking it. We actually liked it. That's one thing that drew us to them. Um, <laughs> I feel like the extending the credit is more of a, when you look at, when, when sort of that blindness starts to fall away and you are more normalized in the relationship and, and the blindness you know, becomes the everyday um, reality or not there in the everyday reality, um, you make a decision, not I can change the person, but this is part of the person, um, maybe not inherently, but this is their character. Do I need somebody perfect, or are these things that are <coughs> unfortunate, but I can live with them? You know, no. because, because we'll never find somebody who doesn't have any faults. So in some way, we have to extend credit some faults in any relationship yeah. and some would be grounds for not being married but there's yeah. a lot of faults that yeah. if we never extended credit we'd never get married <laughs> yeah and um, as I told you, I'm not going to be the guide on this because I can't figure that out <laughs> uh, I mean marriages that I thought couldn't possibly succeed two people wouldn't ever get married, they do get married the marriages work and then a couple that you think's the rock of Gibraltar here, that you know they're divorced. I, so I, I can't figure that out. 
Um, I only know that the considerations of getting married, of married extend beyond really whether there's love or not. See, that, I think that is crucial. And what makes me nervous about the marriage book is that that's not brought out enough. And so when Olson says it romanticizes it and idealizes it, someone reads this and gets so caught up in the grandeur of the love and vision of the other and so on that they think it naturally extends to the marriage and then they don't look at these other considerations. Um, He's pretty blunt, though, about how horrible it can be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, I don't know you didn't you know, know that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to go to Maria because I remembered she had her hand up and I saw it. So go ahead. <laughs> now, the thing is, is with like that, I mean, that's not a credit of love to accept that sort of, I mean, simply, I mean, there is a point, a very practical point here, and whatever quirks you ha- you see in the other one, you better know that they're going to bother you more in marriage because you'll see them every day. They're not going to, like, disappear, you know? So, yeah. I mean, to me, that's not the credit of love that nobody was talking about, to extend that to the person. They were seeing that they're in the credit of love. No, I'm seeing a kind of a fault in the person recognizing that it's a shortcoming of who they truly ought to be. But also, a credit of love doesn't mean that I am convinced or I have this sort of um, overly optimistic hope that I can change it, you know, or that somehow marriage is going to change it. I, I mean, to me, that would seem false. But, I mean, like, I think that I can have a very realistic, I can, I can be both realistic and extend the credit, or I can say, well, this is perhaps something that might never change. I mean, this is something that you know, this person will probably struggle with for the rest yeah. of their life, even though I still can see how it's a short term yeah. of their See, a lot of it depends so much on what particular behavior or quality or attitude or temperament is we're talking about. See? Um, if, you know, he's a well-known gambler and drinking problem and, you know, this sort of thing, and it's still going on, well, you better pretty well think, yeah, that may not really be him. It wasn't always him, but it's likely to continue. And then you've got to decide. See, it it sort of comes back to um, the thought that I had again and again reading this and with your comments is, what happens when you fall out of love? All you, the talk is so much about the vision of the other and the vision of the other and the, the unique affectivity and this sort of thing. But people do fall out of love. There are passages, Hildebrand says, when love stops. Well, what happened there? It isn't, I still love him, but I realize I shouldn't marry him. Or I love her, but I realize I shouldn't marry her. No, it's before the marriage. You fall out of love. Well, what happened? Were there simply dimensions of the person you didn't see before? I'm not sure I can answer that question. I do know many times, lots of times, people fall out of love. Well, what was going on? Was there really no vision to begin with? You thought there was? Thing. Okay, I'm going to go to the people of her. Did you still have a question? No? Mm-hmm. Then I'll go to him. Go. When you say um, people fall out of love, I mean, how does that actually happen? That's what I said, I don't know. I mean, it has to be that you are refusing to forgive yes. and accept the person as they are. Not necessarily. I think, I think that, no, I, fundamentally, I, that's at the basis. And that's when you, you know, grace comes. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the, the situation that I have in mind is, you know, the, the couple goes out a while and I mean, he, he really comes to love her. And then they go out a little bit longer and then he doesn't love her. Doesn't that happen? No, I, don't, I don't think, I think it's it can, can be that um, your will reveals your will. I don't mean that. I mean, she's perfectly nice. 
if you say why, say, I don't know, she's very nice. I, I think she would be a great wife. It's just that I loved her before and I don't love her now. Or maybe I didn't love her. I only liked her a lot. See? Yeah. 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 Yes. It seems to me that because, like, I think it was already said it happened, nobody would get married if everybody is false. So if nobody would get married if there wasn't a certain extent of extended credit. However, then there's this factor of, right, being blind to things that are serious false. So that leads me to just believe that you really need a third party involved, an objective person who can see it. Like, today I think, you know, courtship or dating, whatever, yeah. is so random yeah. um, that by the time the family meets the person, like, yeah. the sort of relationship's already been settled. Yeah. And I think if from the start third parties are involved and, you know, yeah. like having an opinion on whether that was an appropriate yeah. match, you know, regardless of sort of any love attachments that are forming, like, that might, might help the situation. So. But you don't want it arranged. Right, exactly. And here's my experience. And keep in mind, I have seven children. Two of them are married. Um, and one of them is close to, well, he's engaged, so... I stay out of it because <laughs> um, my experience is when the parents get involved, unless it's a very clear case, you know, he has a criminal record, you know, murder or something. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's a perfectly nice man or woman. Um, my experience is that when the parents get involved, and they dissuade the boy or the girl. It often ends up worse. And you're saying, you know, they should have stayed out of it because he was a much better guy, and look at what happened here, and so on. And one thing, um, this is sort of, well, it is maybe relevant to some of the things here, and I've talked to Professor Crosby about this um, because we're so much on the same page, that in raising children, he raised lots of children, I raised lots of children, their development as a person is not something I really see, the parent really sees. A little louder, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, when you're raising children, their development of a, as a person has um, very important dimensions the parent doesn't see. What they like, what they really like. My, my fourth son now, um, is actually in Quantico, Virginia, in a um, officer training boot camp. Um, and he simply announced, you know, he's 16 or 17, he says, oh, yeah, I'm going to join the Marines. And this just comes out of the blue. I, I didn't see this in him at all. And so now with the... Um, so, so what happens is we don't see that development of them the kinds of friends they have, what they like, the person who would attract them, and so on, the parents don't really see them. They may be able to find someone who's very nice, but not necessarily someone that their child would be attracted to. See? So, uh, so I stay out of it. And that would be my recommendation, <laughs> except in extreme cases. Now, you've had your hand up for a long time, and I'm going to go five more minutes and then, um, did you announce, you didn't announce the thing about 8.30 tonight. I'm going to, I'll announce that. Yeah. yeah. We're going to have, for those who want, I'm going to come back onto campus at 8.30, and I'll stay up as long as you want, as long as there's sufficient libations. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, if, if I have to cut you off at 10, because I want to get through at least one of these um, major points before we take the break. But you've had your hand up for a long time. Right. Marriage that was talked about earlier, I'm trying to find the other part, but it was talked about earlier that marriage is sort of this extraordinary choice right. where love is going above and beyond the obligation. Right. And that seems to be very self selfless or self extremely. And and then it seems like maybe falling out of love or whatever that would those things aren't connecting for me. Like it it, it how does it jump from being sort of I don't know. 
but yeah. maybe we'll generate enough interest in Professor Crosby on this because he might go and think about this further and write something up on the falling out of them. Or I don't know that in any other Hildebrand's works um, where this is discussed. So, it, just, it seems like once you make yeah. a choice of marriage, yeah. you are choosing to yeah. sort of this, this extraordinary love that doesn't really have the same and if it's indissoluble because it's a Christian marriage, you're stuck. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, said, now there were four more people. One, two, three, four. And John Henry I can always talk to, so I'm going <laughs> to try. Uh, actually, I'm going to do these two, and then maybe I'll put you off a little later because I'm going to stop at 10. So go ahead. Start with me, okay. A uh, couple of comments. One, one being that the, to the extent that Falling in love is romantic yeah. and simplistic. Yeah. Falling out of love is the opposite. It's still simplistic and romantic. And what's left out in the middle is what I would call the rigors of love. And there are such things. Yeah. Uh, each person has to have not only have a bottom line, but each person yeah. has to assert that bottom line. Yeah. Um, and better before, you know, than after. Yeah. But the other just anecdotally, there's a couple of young women in my family, and one of them married and uh, was going back to her parents several times during the first year, saying, I don't want to divorce the bum, I can't stand it anymore. Yes. And they fought like cats and dogs, you know, and they have a beautiful, happy marriage. Yes. Know? Her sister never fought with her husband. Yeah. They're divorced. Yeah. That's so why I, I say you cannot figure this out. Yeah, no, you, you, you can't figure it out. <laughs> um, quickly. Well, I have um, two, two uh, scenarios which may respond to our connection to um, the issue of falling in love. Where um, through the course of love, as a value response, and your, so your perception of the value is important. And so then, of course, with the selfless, selfless aspect of providing for a family or so. Um, that that part of love we, we want to provide for the other um, and the stresses involved in that may turn your attention more completely to work and with that if, if you're not attentive to perceiving yeah. the love every day to perceive yeah. the beauty of the other every yeah. day then you don't see the value Hildebrand right? makes that point doesn't he yeah so it's not that the value is no longer there you, you don't have, it's not yeah. that Yeah. Yeah. But you see, in the the cost of married life, especially with more children you have, mm -hmm. that's impossible to avoid. If you if you we homeschooled seven kids, plus I was working and so on and so on. And I mean, you, you're just the the activities of the day just rule your life. I'm sorry, that's, yeah, that's and that's sort of one of the points I'm going to make about the family, which um, was in part Olson's criticism. I think that's, that's where you yeah. can't base your, your love on the feeling of love. Because love is the parent's love. Too. Yeah, that, that opens up a whole other door, which I'm not going to enter right now. Um, so let me try to get through one of my five larger portions um, which Professor or Dr. Van Shai said um, came up on Tuesday, I guess. Um, now it seems to me what Hildebrand overlooks is that the respect in which the love between a husband and wife can and even must change during the marriage. A change I'm going to call a maturing of the love. Let me describe three different situations. One is that over time there's a lessening or diminishing of the love by one or both due to changes or defects or faults in the other. So in, we'll have this outside of marriage, or, or it can be in marriage, that 
you simply recognize defects, the person changes, all of a sudden he's um, a certain way. I, I had very two very good friends in high school, um, and um, this one girl, the sweetest girl you're ever going to meet, the other fellow, quite intelligent and so on, both died from liver disease because they became alcoholics. And I would have bet the farm this was impossible. So now this happens and the person's mistreated and, and so on. And so there's a lessening or diminishing of the love. That's one scenario. And you can say, I love you less than I did before because of this. Maybe it can be restored. If there's infidelity, maybe it can never be the same. So that, this is, I paint a very bleak situation here. Okay, that's one. Then there's secondly, what Mrs. von Hildebrand would call the dry spells, in which you have so much going on each day, um, the vicissitudes and turmoils of family life, responsibilities, that um, the love effectively becomes dormant. You almost don't have the time to feel this. There's too much going on. So it's dormant or quieted. That's what I call the dry spell. It isn't really lessened. It's super actually still there, but it's just not there in the prominence it would ordinarily be. Then I want to say there's a third situation, what I call the maturing of love, in a very serious way in which one can say to the other that I don't love you in the same way as when we were first married, not because I love you less, not because there's a dry spell, but because the love has matured. This I find absent in the marriage book. It's as if this vision of the other, the effect of, um, the affection one has for the other remains the same without it maturing in a certain way. To say that I love you, that I do not love you in the same way, is that I love you more, but not in the same way that I had the love originally. Sometimes I said, oh, the love grows deeper. It isn't a quantitative increase. It's a change in the maturity, it's a maturing of the affection itself. It's not a quantitative increasing, but it changes in the quality. It's similar, I would say. I use the term maturing because think of the, what happens from the time someone is four years old to 20 years old. It's a, a very different person, though he's the same person, but he is matured in such a way that one might not even recognize him as this four-year-old, you see? I would, and I want to say it's a higher and deeper love, just like the development of the personality is a maturing to what the individual is. In other words, that if two people are married over 20 years, that love is going to change because of what they go through, the relationships that they have, how they know each other, what they deal with, and so on. And it's actually a maturing, could I even say flowering of the love, especially if there are things, difficulties they have to face together and so on. Loss of job, illness, problems getting along with each other that they've resolved. I have a comment here, but that's going to invite some criticism, so I'm going to skip it. <laughs> I, I, the comment is that I think something of the edge of the I thou is taken off. And I say that because as they've gone through 20 years, I've been married 28 years, as you do that, it's more and more, especially with the family, a we rather than an I thou. I, I find it difficult to believe that someone who's married 30 or 35 years still looks at the other is that I thou when they were first married. It would be strange because I would say, well, you must have had a pretty nice life because to get through 28 or 30 years requires such cooperation and community that it's a, it, 
it's a different situation. Now, believe it or not, and I don't know why we did this. I only know it was about 24 years ago. Professor Vanish, who I mentioned before, and I went to see Mrs. von Hildebrand to precisely discuss this issue. It was before the publication, it was, yeah, it, it, I think it was after the publication of Marriage. Um, uh, by that I mean Sophia Institute's press publication. But before I left to come here, so that would have been, but I don't think I was married, so it would have been about 84, something like that, in which we explain this to her. She kept interpreting it as that second situation, the dry spell. And it was on that basis that she wrote this book by Love Refined, Letters to a Young Bride. Because she kept interpreting what we were saying as periods of the dry spell. And we kept saying, no, it isn't periods of the dry spell. It's a maturing of the love. I grant the dry spell. But that's not the, um, the situation that I'm speaking about. It's this um, maturing of the love. And see, um, I also have in mind a couple of, of actual instances in which people who were married for 8, 10, 15 years now thought their marriage really had certain difficulties because it was not the same as when they first got married. The affections were not the same as when they first got married. Thought they had to go to counseling. And I think it's a misimpression Hildebrand can give that 30 years it's going to be the same. Yes, it grows, but it's just a quantitative deepening. You know, I think there's, it's still love. I mean, wouldn't it make sense? How can someone say after 28 years of marriage, I haven't known this woman, seen her, understood her, in dimensions I couldn't possibly have known before we were married? Isn't that going to affect the affection that I have? Not in the sense that it diminishes it, not in the sense that it's a dry spell, but because it matures in a way because of our life together. See? Yeah. So now I'm right at 10 past 10. As you know, I like to be prompt both for conferences and this. So why don't we take a break and then uh, for 15 minutes and then I will go through the other four points and hopefully there'll still be some time at the end for some discussion.